To what extent it's, it's Donald Camel's film, to what extent it's Nick Rogue's. I mean, tell me about their relationship and how this idea of them as co-directors, which, you know, back in the 60s was a fairly novel idea, how that came to be in the first place. Well, it was Donald's suggestion. I mean, the idea was that Donald would direct the film. Um, and he came to me um, at some point, I think it was in the late spring or whatever, in 68, and he said, listen, I've had an idea. Uh, Nicholas Rogue, uh, who I'd known about as a cinematographer, admired, respected, and uh, he said, I think it would be a good idea if I had somebody to work with. And so um, I think I'd met Nick briefly uh, in passing, but we sat down at, uh, in Soho, as people did in those days, uh, at a restaurant called the Trattoria Terrazza, and um, we talked about what the expectations for the film were, what we wanted to do, and at the end of the lunch, I said, let's do it together. It, it was as simple as that. Um, so Nick came on board, and then the project was presented to Warner Brothers and as, the t as a team effort, really, you know, with Donald and Nick as the co-directors. And their reaction was very negative. They didn't like the idea. First of all, they were worried about uh, new directors at that point. And um, one of the things that I think assured him was that they saw um, Nick Rogue as the professional amongst a bunch of amateurs. Right, okay. And it gave them some sense of confidence and belief that we could do it. Yeah. The simple version, I'm sure maybe it's, it's a little too simple, is that Nick Rogue, as you say, was the professional. He was the man in the, in the suit and tie who dealt with the technicals. Well, so was I in suit and tie at that point. And Donald was the, <laughs> I suppose, the, the poet who, uh, you know, who dealt with the actors and dealt with the, the ambience and the atmosphere of the film. I mean, is that, is that version of events true? Or was I there wouldn't more have called Donald a poet. Uh, okay. I think it could be poetic, but I wouldn't have called him a poet. Donald was a pretty hard-headed person who was extremely ambitious, uh, I think really gifted and talented, was a, an, an artist and then became a screenwriter. Um, and um, so he was looking at it, I think, from two aspects. One, in terms of what the collaboration would bring to the film. What would Nick Rogue act, uh, add as a co-director? And uh, would it be helpful to have a co-director in terms of getting the film made? Because he was still insecure as to whether or not I'd be able to get the money for it. Sure. I mean, we're sitting here tonight as part of the BFI's London on film season, and performance right. is, is always talked about as one of the definitive London films. But as the producer of the movie, I mean, do you see it that way? I mean, do you see London as, as part of the very, you know, the fabric of this movie? Or with a, with a tweak here and there, could you have made performance in L.A.? Could you have made it in Paris? No, it was a film made for London by Londoners. Um, and it, yes, it, it had, the idea was to attempt to capture the essence of what London was at that moment. So I, I couldn't see the film being made anywhere else, you know. I mean, how involved were you in, in choosing the locations? Because obviously Paris Square, you know, we see the exterior of the famous Paris Square shot in Notting Hill. That was just the exterior, wasn't it? And actually the interior was... Lounge Square. Right. I mean, so how involved were you in that? Or was that Donald well, and Nick? Well, um, in terms of actually choosing the locations, it really was Donald and Nick. Um, yeah, we discussed it in the sense that by using um, the interiors in Lounge Square... Um, we could make it very economically, and that was part of the thing. We had to make it for a budget. Um, so that became sort of the dominant factor. But I didn't select the locations, no. I wanted to ask about <laughs> Mick Jagger. In a I went to them, but I didn't select them. Sure. Yeah. I mean, obviously, and it's, it's interesting, actually, because actually you realize that that place in Lounge Square, you know, that's actually, that's where the real magic happens. I mean, Power Square has this yeah. huge kind of... Well, that's the effect. exterior. Sure. Except the atmosphere. One of the lines that I've heard about Jagger in particular is that he was the one character, one actor in the film who didn't end up playing a version of himself. Everyone, ended, everyone including James Fox, ended up playing themselves to some extent, but Jagger didn't. I mean, is that a fair account of events? Well, I wouldn't have seen it that way myself. Okay. I've got to be honest with you. Um, I think it, certainly James was from a very, very different background, a different sensibility. Uh, that wasn't his world. He was brought into that world. Um, whereas Jagger, yes, I could see him. He never ended up to be a recluse, anything but. 
but nonetheless, the atmosphere, the musicianship, um, the eccentricity, the sex, the drugs, everything that went with it, that was his world. But how strange an experience do you think James Fox had while actually making the film? Because, I mean, he's talked a little bit about... There well, are rumours that swirl around, around Donald Cameron. Essentially, you know, what you see taking place in the film with yeah. Turner was kind of what Donald Cameron was doing to James Fox, this upper-class English actor who he was dosing up and kind of playing mind games with. Well, there was a very good uh, interview with James in The Guardian last... I think it was about a week ago. Um, and he was very candid about it. Um, he came into this world... Uh, and he had to learn about the world. And I think he felt very much um, an outsider in some ways, coming into this scene with Donald and uh, Mick and Anita Pallenberg and um, uh, Michel Breton. These were all sort of creatures of, that Donald had uh, you know, known and worked with. and. and um, so, and they played some mind games with James as well. Um, but he fitted into it brilliantly. He um, went for it. He liked the sex and the drugs and the rock and roll. And I think it sort of seduced him in, to some extent. He came from a very, very different background. I mean, I was going to ask, it's, inevitable, it's an inevitable question, I know, but I was going to ask quite how much sex, drugs, and rock and roll there was on set, because again, the rumors are that there was fairly hardcore debauchery taking place pretty much all the time. But I mean, was that, could, could a film actually be made if, if all the stories were true about performance? Could you have actually made a film at all? Well, if you take all the stories and you look at it from that point of view, the, the film never would have been completed. Um, but I'm sure there was some sex on the set after shooting. Um, <laughs> uh, but, I, you know, it, it, the sex, I think, took place elsewhere. Okay. Yeah. The one thing we haven't discussed is, is <laughs> the other thing that was happening on set, which is the crime, actually, because you've got a film in performance which is about London criminality and criminals. And also you had London criminals involved. I mean, there were some quite shady characters with David Litvinoff, Johnny Binden, who would later be tried for murder. Tell me a little bit about working with those people. And I mean, how involved were you in the process of bringing them into the, into the making of performance? Well, um, I've got to say that really Donald and Nick in terms of the casting, uh, we discussed the casting together, but a lot of the ideas for that kind of casting came from Donald and Nick. We were trying to make something that felt real, authentic, um, that captured the sort of essence of this duality in terms of homosexuality, gangsters, crime. Uh, and so I think that initiative came from Donald and Nick to a large extent. But we discussed it, we talked about it. Um, Johnny Binden was a great addition. Uh, he was a natural actor, you know, as most gangsters are, really. They're hams, in a way. Um, certainly the craze were. And um, it, it, it helped James, um, the actor who played uh, Harry Flowers, um, they, they all came from that background and that world, and it brought something to the film and to the set and to the authenticity. And it uh, was not a problem working with them. They liked it. Performance always seems like the kind of film that will have changed the people who, the very people who made it. I mean, is that fair to say? Did it change you, making performance? I'm sure it did in many ways. I think it changed all of us. It was... Um, um, the kind of experience that has an effect on you and that changes you um, and in different ways. And I think it changed all of us in different ways. I mean, James went off and disappeared for a year and um, went to the Amazon in Brazil and you know, lost complete touch with him for a year and he came back uh, born again Christian and devoted to what he believed in. Um, Donald went off to Hollywood and killed himself, um, tragically. Um, Nick went off and you know, was a professional and continued his career, but nonetheless, the echoes of performance resurfaced in a lot of the films that he directed subsequent to performance. Um, yeah, I, I, th I think it was a, a, 
a changing thing. Certainly for me, you know, I'd come from being an agent representing actors and writers and directors, so I learned something about producers um, and producing. Um, and uh, that experience changed me as well, yeah. And I think working on that film, um, we were under siege in a way, making the film. Your financier and distributor hates it from the word go, doesn't like it, doesn't want to be involved with it. And you begin to question your own judgment and yourself in those situations. Well, I wanted to ask about that, actually, because, again, obviously one of the, the, the myths that circulates, or maybe it's not a myth about the film, is that when the film was finally shown to Warner Brothers, the wife of a Warner's executive actually threw up in the screening room. I mean, again, maybe you want to confirm... Not a screening that I was at, you know. OK. Um, but quite possibly, yeah. OK. <laughs> That's good, though. I mean, you know... <laughs> For me, that's one of the things I liked about performance because it felt extreme and it provoked people into hating it or loving it. Some people were indifferent to it. Uh, but nonetheless, generally, it provoked a strong reaction. And I've always admired that about films that are able to do that. And it's one of the things that I love about performance is that um, it had that ability. I mean, now it feels pretty tame and when you consider what you see on screen in terms of sex and violence and drugs and, and threesomes and whatever you, you know, want to call it. Yeah, but there's something else going on with performance. There's a sort of, there's an ambience. There's well, there's a mind game that yeah. goes on in performance as well. And it's got depth and, and different layers to it. Um, so it isn't just about sex or just about drugs. Um, that's something that maybe is, you know, challenges the intellect occasionally. Sure. I wanted to ask one more question and hand over to the floor. I mean, you mentioned Donald Camel and, and his career subsequently. Obviously, Nick Rogue, obviously, as we all know, went on and made wonderful films that we all cherish. And Donald Camel had a much more marginal career. I mean, did it surprise you that after performance he made films so sporadically, you know, and that he does almost end up, you have to kind of retrieve him from becoming a footnote, you know? Well, I mean, he made a couple of really good films in, in Hollywood. Um, they weren't terribly Hollywood films. But nonetheless, I think what it demonstrated was that um, he was a gifted and talented filmmaker. Um, but, um, you know, people are, <laughs> it's a cliche, but Los Angeles seduces filmmakers. First of all, that town is built on seduction. And so if you find somebody that, um, in, you know, that might be of interest to you, you try and seduce them. You try and bring them to you. And um, Hollywood was like that for a few minutes with Donald. And, but just a few minutes. Once it discovered who he was, what his sensibilities were, the kind of films that he wanted to make, um, he was under heavy suspicion and excluded from the community in a way. And he, he lived up in some remote, very nice house up in the Hollywood Hills, near the reservoir, near the Hollywood sign. Um, and um, once again, that set him apart. He wasn't part of the Hollywood scene. Um, so it, um, it was a yeah, tragic death. I mean, uh, suicide is not something that we contemplate until it faces us. Very different. Um, it's a 15 to 20 minutes shorter now. Um, but the style of editing um, is completely different as well. It was a much more, it was a linear narrative and storyline. Um, and it worked on that level. It worked brilliantly on that level, but what you had was a much deeper in-depth look at the London of that time. Um, gangsters, um, their relationship to society, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so in the re-edit, um, a style evolved in terms of the flash floors, flashbacks, uh, time sequences, uh, et cetera. Um, so quite different.
we touched on this earlier, actually. I mean, what's happened to the material which was cut from performance? I don't know. We've never been able to find it. I mean, the, the, all the material apparently was transferred from Technicolor in London, where we finally ended up with the film, to Technicolor in LA. And Warner Brothers says the material was junked, thrown away. And I, you never know. You know, the great thing about film is it turns up Sometimes 50, 60, 70, 100 years later, somebody you know, has got something somewhere. Um, and maybe it will turn up. I don't know. But we've been unable to I'll find it. You know. well, it was intentionally ambiguous. Um, I think that was the style of the film. Um, so, yes, you're led to believe that, uh, you know, um, Turner had been killed, and we saw him in the closet. Uh, and then, of course, there's Turner at the end in the Rolls Royce driving away with um, Harry Flowers. So um, it meant, yeah, this part of this duality of character and, and uh, personality, and it's all part of it. <laughs> Ambiguous is it good way to describe it. The screenplay has never been published to my knowledge, um, but just taking up that point, most screenplays that are published aren't necessarily actually the screenplay that was used to shoot the film. They're usually um, uh, or somebody is given the job of transcribing the dialogue in the film and the action in the film, and that becomes the re final release script. Um, and so, even if the film, if the film script was published, it wouldn't actually be the authentic script. And that's the way in 99% of the cases when you, those of you who do read film scripts of, of films that have been made and you will find that it's a release script rather than the final draft that was actually the shooting script. Although it is such an interesting point because we were talking about it earlier. For all, I mean, the radical aesthetic of this film, you know, and this, this incredible visual personality that it has, people, people quote the film endlessly, and actually there are these lines of dialogue which just circle and circle and circle, and we were saying that, you know, one of the films, one of the things that gave the film a second life really was Bands in the 80s, Big Audio Dynamite, Happy Mondays, taking almost catchphrases and making catchphrases of lines of dialogue. So mm. it is interesting, isn't it, that no one's ever taken that script yeah. and just kind of cherished it as a piece of, almost a piece of prose. Well, you know? the great thing was that the Guardian did a, an interview with James Fox and myself. And uh, it was posted online, obviously. Uh, and um, the people who had, who commented, there must have been 50 or 60 of them that used lines of dialogue from the film. And I remember once having a meal with Bill Nighy, and at some point in the meal, he just stood up and started quoting lines of dialogue from performance. And I thought, pretty, pretty I tweeted, good. I tweeted on the way that I was actually coming here tonight, and then someone instantly messaged me to say, uh, you'll look funny when you're 50. So yeah, yeah. As far as the screenplay was concerned, um, Donald wrote the screenplay, gave me, well, he wrote a treatment first, and we discussed the treatment. Um, and then he went away and wrote the screenplay, and we discussed the screenplay. And there were adjustments and changes and, um, that came out of the conversations uh, we had. We talked about the casting, so I had some input on that. Um, but it was my first effort as a producer, and I really was unsure of what a producer actually did, or how much you could or how little you could contribute. So it was an exercise for me in trying to find my way to see whether there was room for some contribution, um, or at some point I felt I was, on, I was there for the ride, you know. Yeah, I had to deal with Warner Brothers and, and uh, the publicity and, and uh, all of that and, and, and budget uh, to a certain extent. Um, but it was, you know, movies, once they start, they're like a train. They kind of build up ahead of steam and they have a life of their own. 
and um, producers can make a contribution. And I might have made a contribution in terms of saying, let's make this film. And here's a few ideas. Um, but it really is Nick Rogue and, and Donald Campbell's film in that sense, artistically. Did you have any inkling? I mean, because so much of the, the, the magic of performance, I guess, is that sense. It's, it's almost like it feels like a home movie. It feels like something which happened and was just, you know, cameras were set rolling and then, you know, they recorded whatever was going on in front of them. Did you have any inkling at that moment that you were going to, this was, you were making something where you were going to be sitting here in 2015 discussing it and pouring over it with, with an audience who are obviously still kind of enthralled by it now? I didn't, and I don't think most filmmakers do. I mean, I think some, um, you know, particularly Hollywood movies, well, we're making this film, like this is an Oscar movie, you know, and um, so that's the rationale for making it because we're going to get Oscar nominations and it's going to make the film more successful or maybe we'll get the Academy Awards. That comes into, I think, some people's choice of material and what they decide to do. Uh, but most of the time, filmmakers don't really say, I'm making something you know, that is meaningful and that's going to you know, do this and that. You may think that. Uh, you may hope that. Uh, but you don't necessarily believe that this is the film you're... No, I don't... I don't. That's such a... No. Um, I didn't feel that way anyways. Um, she was always Donald's first choice. And um, Warner Brothers was saying, hey, you know, how about getting a... She had done a, a um, couple of movies in uh, Germany and some, one in particular, uh, really uh, brilliant film. Um, and um, but Warner's kept on saying, well, you know, maybe you can get a movie star or whatever. And uh, I had known an um, actress called Tuesday Weld, who was very well known in the States at that time, television series. And um, so we got Tuesday Weld to come to London and to do an audition. Um, and we had a little kind of drinks party at at my apartment, um, uh, and there was an odd guy there who was, a, he wasn't a chiropractor, but he was one of these guys who said he knew how to, you know, she had a bad, bad back traveling on the airplane or whatever. Anyways, um, he did something to her, and um, she ended up breaking her wrist. <laughs> and she wow. accused us of doing this intentionally. Uh, and um, so Anita was always the first choice. Uh, <laughs> you, broke, you broke James Fox and Tuesday Well. Um, well, we physically assaulted Tuesday Well. But she was a great trooper anyway. She was cool. Yeah. We'll have to leave it there, I'm afraid. But please join me in thanking Sandy Lieberson.